Welcome everyone to the 2022 BeaverWorks Summer Institute UASR course, or Unmanned Aerial Systems Synthetic Aperture Radar course. I am Ben Marka of Lincoln Labs, and it has been my pleasure to be the lead instructor for the course this year. Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR, is a radar imaging technique that is used to image the surface of the world. SAR is typically applied by not only our nation's military, but also by planetary and climate scientists. During this remote course, the students worked in teams to develop all of the software-based commands, communication, and processing to develop SAR images from an emulated radar. Through an iterative development process, the students were able to incrementally improve their complex systems to make them more efficient, more practical, and more user-friendly. The teaching staff continued to be in awe of not only the students' technical abilities and excellent teamwork, but also their drive to perfect their work on these concepts that are typically reserved for graduate level students or even working professionals. We hope that you will see and appreciate the excellent work the students will be presenting today, and we encourage you to engage with them, not only to learn more about the science, they've science and technology they've developed, but also to see how this course has changed their perception of STEM and the roles in these fields. Thank you for your time, and again, welcome to UASR. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I want to make sure that the students get as much time as possible to show you what they've been working on. So we're going to dive right into their presentations. Um, for the audience, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to type them in the Slido box. You should see that on the right of your, uh, your webcast window. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that so I can relay them to the students once they get to the end of their presentations. So with that, first up, we have Team 5. Hi, everyone. We're Team 5 uh, in the U.S. Wire co uh, course. Um, yeah. um, just to give a bit of an introduction, I'm Rashida. I'm Kian. I'm Alice. And I'm G. Let's start. Today will be uh, start, uh, start by covering uh, what exactly is SAR. And then we will go on to explain our program and what we actually did. And then we'll also talk about the challenges we encountered along the way. And then finally, some optimi optimizations we made at the end. So uh, what exactly is SAR? Uh, it stands for a lot of different things, you know, just a bunch of random stuff. But the main thing that, uh, that we are doing is synthetic aperture radar. Yeah, so a bit about SAR. If you're not already familiar with radars, they are kind of detection technology. And essentially, they're a sensor that sends out radio waves. And based on the data they get back and how they get these waves back, they determine distance, angle, and the velocity of objects. Now, synthetic aperture radar, also known as SAR, is a special kind of radar. It uses the antenna motion over a, moving over a target range to provide better spatial resolution than usual stationary radars. So as uh, Rishida touched upon, uh, we're, we're basically, synthetic aperture radar is basically having a small antenna on a moving platform, such as a plane that moves across a large area to achieve the effects of having uh, this uh, antenna with a huge size. And as we can see here, so for, uh, we just put a couple examples of resolution pictures to show how large of an actual antenna we would need if we don't have SAR. So for one meter resolution, it, you can't really see anything, but that already required 20 times larger than uh, a antenna, 20 times larger than the platform. And for uh, 0 0.5 meter resolution, that you can probably see something, but you can't still like spot specific, like for example, in real life, like people or car or buildings. And, and with that, we go to 0 0.05 meter resolution, which, yeah, we can see, um, we can see probably we can, uh, what it is. However, in that, we need 400 times antenna larger than the platform. So why do we use SAR over optical images? Well, optical images, when you're flying over a certain location, it could be affected by the weather, there could be clouds in the way, or there's fog. 
you really need kind of a perfect day to see exactly what you're seeing. So MSAR can see right through uh, any weather. So SAR is used usually. Um, it could also differentiate between uh, different materials such as like metals. Um, and since we have like a moving small uh, moving small antenna, we no longer need like a huge antenna for the same resolution. So uh, where do we use SAR? Uh, we use SAR to uh, look at uh, the terrain and surfaces of other planets in our own planet uh, to discover uh, the, the, top, the topography and geograph uh, geography of the uh, environment. And it's also used in uh, forestry and disaster response, as well as ocean for oil spills and flooding. But one of the most common applications is in the military. Okay, after we go through the physics of what SAR is, we're gonna go through a core algorithm behind SAR, which is back projection, which is the algorithm we use to paint the image with receiving data from small moving antenna. And as you can see, the graph on the very left is the actual data we're receiving. On the y-axis is the range, which means the distance away of that certain data point uh, from our uh, plat moving platform web plane. And the uh, um, uh, y-axis is just the amplitude, which is the how strong the signal is when we receive it at the certain point. And the middle graph is the, the actual visualization of the graph on the left um, with, uh, with painted with colors. And in this case, yellow means a stronger amplitude and blue means a lighter, uh, like a less amplitude. And, and on the very right is the actual image we're painting and this video sort of shows the process that we're, how we paint those image. So as we can see, there's this is a flight path through here. And the middle, it's each the um, data we receive for each scan. And we just paint circles, circles, circles on top of circles, circles. And finally, we'll receive. So we can see here, look at this dot. It's slowly getting clearer and clearer. And that's uh, when the as the as the plane is flying, so that's basically how we can spot specific targets and objects using SAR. So onto our task, we were given an emulator to simulate the Pulsar 440 radar, but now our task was to figure out how to make use of this radar generated data to actually generate images. So um, a quick recap of everything that we've done over every week. So the first week we sort of learned about radar systems and how they worked. Uh, we set up uh, client and server connections, which is important because we had to actually be able to interact with the radar that we were working with. And the second week uh, we continued to try out different configurations for the radar um, that we were interacting with and like figuring out how to actually like, you know, get it to give us usable data and format it. And then we started on the back projection algorithm, which is that thing that uh, Alice was talking about. Um, over week three, we would um, we got the al algorithm working finally after a long debugging process. Um, we uh, vectorized the algorithm and other processes to make the system a lot faster. We'll get into what that is in a second. And then in week four, we just improved the efficiency and the user experience and the interface. And then we did the final event on the last day. So we started on week one with um, trying to plan how we're going to approach um, our program. Um, and the steps we uh, decided on is number one, first connect to the emulator from um, our client file and then compose and format uh, messages uh, that, make, uh, that the client sends to the emulator and the emulator sends back. Uh, messages like setting the configuration of the radar, and et cetera. And um, then number three, we're, we're basically at that point, we're talking, quote unquote, to the emulator, receiving, sending messages. Um, and then after um, the, the emulator is collecting data, we will receive that data and um, uh, break it down. Um, and then we save that received data in a usable form. And then after that, we'll uh, process 
that receive data and then use a Python class called matplotlib to help um, plot the image using the data that we collected. So in the previous slide, Kian talked about being able to connect with the emulator and receive all these messages and be able to actually talk with it. So the first step was to set up communication with the radar. Now the emulator file is basically the simulator for the radar. And we set up a client file for a program and then use the socket connection with UDP protocol to, to establish communication. And here's like a snippet of how we do it. And uh, this is our basically our communication structure, our code structure for the first part of the um, of the communication. Uh, as you can see, all those messages, those are from our end, and those are um, radar end, and we just send this a bunch of messages to radar, of course, one by one, and we receive them back. And um, those messages are in hexadecimal and their form and their byte string. So that did give us a little bit of a problem because at the start, we didn't really know how to convert from like, let's say a byte to hexadecimal and then to integer, we, which we can then inter like interpret. But, but later on, we figure out, we just use Python libraries <laughs> and um, we just put the uh, string in and the process of our communication starts from just basically establishing the, the connection as uh, Rishida and Kian has explained. And then we check if, we, if the communication is set up correctly. So we send them a value and check for the return value. And then we set configuration and we check whether that configuration is set. And then we send control request, which means saying, okay, we're ready to receive data. And at the end, finally, the, the emulator starts sending us real data. So um, some challenges that we encountered in the first week. Uh, it was a pretty difficult process, uh, the socket connection, just because it was you know difficult to figure out where to start. Um, turning hexadecimal format into bytes, that was important because um, the emulator uses hexadecimal, which is a base six unit, which has its advantages, but is difficult to convert to unless you, you know, use the built-in library. Um, we were not able to anticipate the number of messages coming from the emulator uh, because it didn't tell us the scan count and the number of messages total. So we used that to our advantage. Um, or sorry, it did tell us that. So we would just use that as the maximum for our function. Um, our emulator and client messages were different. Uh, that was a problem. So um, we figured that something was wrong with our encoding and decoding process. Um, so we ended up changing uh, how the ends behaved and like, you know, uh, starting from a different place. So um, some of the features we did uh, during week two, um, the algorithm that we developed, we, we finally figured out how to actually create back projection. Uh, so we would generate um, a bunch of numbers on the two axes that would be the pixels. Um, and we did that in what's called a NumPy array, which is a really quick way to handle multidimensional data um, because Python's very slow with that. So then for each scan, we calculated the range and the closest range bin. So we do that by you know, going through every single pixel and finding the distance of that pixel to the radar and then finding out which amplitude of the wave that corresponded to. Um, and when doing that for every single scan and we sum those values up into giant um, pool sort of for each pixel. And then we would plot that data into an image. Um, so yeah, that was sort of how that happened. Yeah, you heard about like, you know, G talk about our algorithm and like with that five point scatter image and everything sounds, well, everything sounds reasonable. Everything sounds fine, right? <laughs> However, actually in week two, throughout the whole week, we never get, so that five point scatter plot in the last slide, actually from, from our third week and throughout the second week, we didn't get an actual image. So like we, we got sort of images. We got this repetitive pattern of some sort of way. We get this Minecraft looking concentric circle. It's kind of cool, right? And we get this not concentric, but still circles painting upon each other. And finally, this, I don't even know what that is. Some sort of circle thingy. 
but basically we're getting all sorts of wrong and inaccurate image and we've been, we've been debugging throughout the whole week too to try to figure out what, what happened with our code because theoretically it should work, right? And in the end, we figure out it was the emulator error that like we didn't pull the new emulator from the, from the GitHub that um, the course provided. So a nice lesson, um, check your GitHub re uh, frequently. Uh, uh, we were doing thousands of scans with thousands of pixels by thousands of pixels, and it took a, a lot of time, um, 20 minutes sometimes. I remember sometimes it took upwards of an hour. We, we never ran it up to an hour. We just found the estimated time to be that. Um, this is because we used nested for loops. At the largest point, it was three nested for loops. Um, so that just it's just iterating everything three times. And so the time complexity is called cubic time complexity. It's just whatever you have qubit, and that's the amount of time that it takes to actually run it, which we didn't want to do. Yeah, so on week three, one of the primary things we tried to tackle was like this whole problem about time. So system efficiency, we made a separate file for back projection, which we were able to vectorize. And like G said, we previously used uh, like three for loops within each other, and that had like a cubic time complexity. However, uh, we are able to use NumPy arrays to be able to vectorize this code and change it to only a few lines of code. And uh, this is able to generate a thousand by a thousand pixels and a thousand scan image in around 4.8 seconds. We also changed our code structure. So we basically read data from the client file and this data gets updated in the local data list file we made. And this is in a pickle file. And then we have another back projection file with our algorithm. And this is run with the data list pickle file using parameters from our configuration file, which includes variables we set like range resolution and scan count and et cetera. So as um, <clears throat> Rashida covered, um, during the third week, we made massive time improvements. Um, we basically had made three versions of our algorithm. The first version didn't even work on week two, and it took a very long time, as um, I think uh, G mentioned, and we would get those weird images that Alice was showing earlier. Um, and then version two, um, version two uh, worked. Um, it was a little slower. I think we were still using uh, some nested for loops, so we we're just trying to get rid of those. Um, both of these took um, both of these took multiple minutes to plot that five point scatter that we were showing earlier for only a hundred scans of data. Um, version two, I think, took three four minutes to plot that, um, and at a very low resolution. But finally, version three uh, took full advantage of vectorization, as uh, Rashida explained in the last slide, using NumPy arrays, which are very quick in Python, um, and we could get through the data very quickly. And this only took about five seconds to get through a thousand scans a day, which is 10 times more data than we were using in versions one and two. And other than improving efficiency, we also deal with the error models. Thank you, Ben and uh, Rama. Um, they actually coded this emulator with actual error models that we could have encountered in real life. Right, and those those errors are um, basically like there's three major type of error. One's the built-in test error, which is which means that the emulator could have sent us uh, misguiding or inaccurate data. And there's package loss, which means um, packets and messages sent by the emulator back to us it may be dropped, so it just may be like blink, nothing happened. And or and out of order error, which means that like when we receive data, we receive each data for scanning chunks, right? They're in different chunks, we have to piece them together. But however, sometimes if we could receive chunk, later chunk before a previous chunk, we'll have to sort that. But yeah, luckily we'll be able to, we were able to deal with all those um, error models with yeah, so we spent a majority of week three and a bit of week four trying to work through these error models. 
Our previous program read messages by their message ID, where we had a message ID variable and we used to increment that after each message. And our data list would just move like that. It was like we just append data that we got, but the error model sent messages in random orders and they weren't chronological, which posed a problem. So to fix this, we changed our program to create a NumPy array of zeros uh, for the data storing. And instead of just um, like putting in new values for the first time, we changed the values of the NumPy array depending on the messages we get from the emulator. And this way we could append like message 30, 36 before message 19. And we didn't have to really worry about drop messages. And um, well, during week four, well, we worked on those error models and we also made improvements to the user interface. Uh, one of those improvements was adding an uh, active, uh, active bar or a progress bar uh, that ran during our program that helps us uh, looks, uh, that helps us like find how, when, what part is the program running? So how long, and it would give us an estimated time of how long it would, took, it would, it would take. Um, so that was very helpful for us. Um, and we also added a little user interface that asks questions to the user about um, what system they're running on, either Windows or Mac, um, as uh, in the code, it's a little different for, for uh, both systems. And then if we want to run a new scan or not, or just take the previous data from the data last pickle uh, file that was mentioned earlier, um, and which image we're running on. So the uh, the graph was labeled correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Team Five. Um, as a reminder, if anybody has any questions, throw them in the Slido box uh, to the right. We will uh, take a look at them. We can ask them to the students. Um, so we'll give uh, a couple minutes for those to to come in. But in the meantime, we have uh, a couple questions for you. Uh, so first one is, um, was there any moment during the course where you felt like you couldn't progress any further? And tell yes. us about that. Yeah, um, <laughs> yes. I can take this one. I guess uh, in week two, I think we had a whole slide of like bad images that Alice talked about. And uh, at this point, like our program, we we felt that it was like we did it right. Like we thought that we had the algorithm nailed down, but like the images just weren't producing. And then that's when we figured out we didn't have like the latest version of the emulator. So I guess that was some time where we felt we weren't progressing really. Yeah, yeah. honestly, like theoretically it should work. It's like the line, like is the line I said the most during that whole week. <laughs> yeah, I think I heard that one at least a couple times. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, next question is, uh, what are some of the things which you were unaware about uh, of the real world technology that this course enlightened you on? I honestly had no idea how radars work beyond they send a pulse and they time the receiving part. Like I did not know that that was this that there was this much complexity going on behind the scenes uh, just to, you know, generate an image. All right, then thank you very much team five. Next up we have team three. Okay, so I think we can get started. Hi everyone, I'm Ava. I'm from the Bay Area, California, and I'm a rising senior. Uh, I'm Hon Hon, and I'm also from the Bay Area, and I'm also a rising senior. I'm Richard, I'm from the Boston area, and I'm a rising senior as well. Uh, I'm Andrew, I'm from New York City, and I'm a rising senior. I'm Jake, I'm from the California Bay Area, and I'm a rising junior. Okay, so we are team three from the US UAS SAR course, and let's get started with our final presentation. Here's a brief run through of what we plan to cover today. Okay, we can now move on to the first point. So let's go over the basics of radar. So what is radar? Radar stands for radio detection and ranging. So how radars work is that radars will send an electromagnetic wave to an object and the wave will bounce off of the object back to the radar. And radars rely on this wave that bounces back to detect the object. Radars can measure the distance of an object 
allowing radars to be able to produce images that take into account the distance an object is from the height that the radar is at. Since radars rely only on the waves that they send and receive, radars can work under any weather and under any lighting because those factors do not influence detection of an object by radar. So for example, an image taken optically shows that there are clouds in the sky, but the image that the radar produces is not influenced by these clouds and provides an image that bypasses them and shows what's underneath. Now, what is SAR? SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar. SAR behaves similarly to a radar with a large aperture. A larger aperture produces a smaller beam of energy or higher gain, resulting in a higher signal-to-noise ratio, which is an indicator of the effectiveness of the scan data. SAR works by taking multiple scans of an object as the SAR is moving. These multiple scans will be combined, generating an image with a much higher resolution. The synthetic aperture radar acts as a sensor that transmits signals and receives signals from the Earth's surface. In SAR, a drone or airplane flies above and to the side of the area it's working to image. It emits pulses at intervals which come together to essentially form an image. Bringing all these different pulses together forms an image of high resolution. As the drone flies over various parts of the landscape, the pulses are pieced together and the overlap points are found and thus an image is formed. Hi, my name is Jake, and now I'll go over the command and control aspect of our radar system. Radar command and control is essentially the way we communicate between us as the user, our code as the program, and our radar, which when online is replaced by a radar emulator. Our code would send inputs and command data to the emulator, and the emulator would collect and process that data, simulating an actual radar, and then return it to the host and return it to us as scan data. Being online, we can't work with a physical radar and environment to scan. So instead we use an emulator and communicate it through the rules of an API. However, it is built to be very similar to the real setup, which is sending UDP formatted packets over an ethernet cable. Now our radar system is made of many different layers. Our, the lowest level of our program described by the leftmost image which deals with sending individual messages in hexadecimal or binary. To form the message, we have to first compose a message with the piece of information we have to send the radar and then convert it into binary and format it according to the rules we are given. These rules together are called the API. The API is made of rules that define the type and the format of the message, messages that we should send the radar. And it also tells us what responses we expect to receive. Now, once we have made our message, we use tools from a helpful Python library. So now all we need to do is to give our message to the tool and the emulator will receive it and send back a response. Then we input in the message, we input the command type and the command details. And what we receive is a response in hex following the rules of the API. Now hex is very different from normal plain text. So we still have to translate that. Now, sending things like message ID and radar settings over and over and over again, every time we run the emulator is a pretty bad system to have. So we built another layer on top of it. In the middle image, we packed, we packaged the boot up commands and the scan commands into black boxes. So now all we send into the booting function is the data we want to send. And all we get out of the scanning black box is the raw data. Now things are easier and we don't have to handle individual messages. Finally, on the rightmost image, we write a back projection algorithm and package all the message handlers together. So now we take that scan data from the scanning black box and send it directly into our back projection algorithm. The only information we have to input now is a radar configure, radar settings, final image settings, and a file describing the environment we want to scan. The output we get from our program is a processed image and a data file that we can save or send to our instructors. So now we can control both the main program and the emulator with one single command, one single command and receive a polished, polished image and data file. The environment file I mentioned earlier also contains both the locations of targets and the flight path of our UAV. 
the emulator uses this and our settings to send scan data back. At each specified point on the path that we give the emulator, our simulated UAV will make a scan of its environment and record its position. We combine both the information from that scan and the location the scan was taken from in the back projection algorithm. In our back projection algorithm, we generate the images from the scan data, which contains data on the amplitude of the signal it received back, as well as data on how far the reflector is. With only this data, we can draw rings by matching the distance of each pixel to the radar with the corresponding signal amplitude. This can be seen in the first image. The radar is in the bottom left at the center of the rings, and as the radar moves to the right, the rings are overlaid on each other, and at points where there is a reflector, they overlap much more than at other points, causing the reflectors to stand out and eliminating noise. So in terms of optimization, um, as the other teams mentioned, uh, having for loops in Python code is notoriously very slow as there's no parallelization. So it all happens all in a row, which can be very slow. So uh, in order to remedy this, we tried to vectorize as many functions as possible with numb to kind of get rid of for loops and ensure the speed of that. And we also introduced a just-in-time compiler, which basically makes the code compile every single time it's run instead of just once. And that definitely brought up the speed because before we were using, or we were running the code on an image with a million pixels with like 2000 scans. And that was taking a very long time. It was like 30 seconds per scan, which would take 90 minutes overall. But with the new code, with the new compiler and um, the vectorization we've done, it only takes about 20 seconds now. And we'd like to show you a demo. So this is our configuration file. We're going to demonstrate this on a offline image. So these three attributes are the main things that we're focusing on here. We have a display resolution of 1,000 by 1,000 and a display size of 300 by 300. And the image is centered at 0, 0. So we're going to run our uh, file here. I'm just changing our directory into where our code is stored. We'll run the back projection file. And it'll prompt us if we want to run with offline data. If you press no, it'll run it through the emulator, but we're going to stay offline for now. So we bring in the pickle file, and it's going to process it. This is sped up slightly, but you can see the, um, the second counter here. It takes about 20 to 30 seconds for a scan like this with 1,000 by 1,000 with uh, 2,000 scans. So because it was 300 by 300, this is a pretty wide range, but we can still see an image here. And we can focus on it even more. So a nice thing about this process is that we can do it iteratively. So we can see that this image falls somewhere between negative 30 and 0 on the x-axis and negative 90 and negative 60 on the y-axis. So we can change the uh, image center to kind of target in on it. Just double checking the center of it here. And then we'll also lower the display size to kind of focus the view in on the image. And then we'll just rerun the back projection file on it. And now we have a much clearer image, and you can see that it is. In fact, the Space Shuttle Endeavor. And if you've noticed, there's not much contrast in the image like there was before. So we actually add something to our code that lets us on the fly just adjust the color range. You can see here in the terminal, I'm dropping it down from 0 to 200,000. You can see there's much more contrast in the images. You, know, you can see it much better. And I dropped it five, uh, 50,000 more. It's even clearer now. So yeah, that's an example of our code running on some offline data. And uh, thank you for everyone at PwSci for an awesome summer. All right, thank you very much, Team 3. That was great. Um, does anybody have any questions for them? Uh, I have a question. How often did you guys use the um, uh, color range changing thing to actually get clear images? Like, was it something that you did all the time, or? Yeah, we yeah, used totally it a lot since 
with a lot of the images, when we zoomed in, the contrast would basically disappear. So this was our solution. Yeah, and if we also took more scans, we would have more overlapping circles and the strength from each pixel would go up. So sometimes if we added too many scans, the whole entire screen would just be at the maximum brightness. So we would have to scale the color range even further up so we could get a recognizable image. We still, we haven't gotten the time to make something that adjusts the color automatically. All right, well, we have a, uh, we have a couple more. So um, could you highlight some of the difficulties your group encountered uh, and explain your approach to dealing with them? So one of our difficulties was that originally we had to run both the emulator and the R program separately. And we were able to write a program that could do both of them at the same time. And another difficulty was, as I mentioned earlier, when we zoomed in, the contrast would disappear and we solved it, as you saw with our code to adjust the color range on the fly. All right, uh, Jane, do you have your hand up? Yeah, so I have another question for this group. In what ways did you guys ensure a collaborative environment? Uh, I can take this one. Uh, I'll, pretty much all of the tools that we used gave or enabled opportunities for collaboration. We all coded on VS Code, which has a live share feature. So many times we were literally coding in the same IDE, which is really nice because if someone was struggling with something, you'd say, hey, check out line, whatever, and we'd be able to help. We also used Git and GitHub, which is a way to kind of manage different pieces of code. And that definitely helped uh, as well because if someone was having an issue with a specific thing, we could isolate it and work on it. Um, yeah, and besides that, just making sure that we would debug with everyone in mind, you know, we did a lot of testing to make sure that the code would work just as well on everyone's devices. You know, some people are using Windows, some Mac, some people had different hardware specifications. So, um, you know, we just wanted to make sure that it worked for everyone. All right, great. Thank you. All right, then we'll move on to the next group. Next up, we have group one. Hi everyone, this is UAS Sara Team One. I'm Piyush Sethi. I'm Nicholas McGovernick. I'm Samuel Bona. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm Chinmay Renate. And I'm Justin Choi. So Sara, as the name suggests, it's a type of radio detection and raging device or radar that is installed on an airborne pl platform like satellites or the image shown on the right. The specific one is used to study earth sciences such as earthquakes, and vegetation and volcanoes. SAR also has many other applications, including surveillance, earth resource mapping, and environmental monitoring. And it's because of its highly valued property of forming an image, even in inclement weather. It can see through darkness, cloud, rain. And this is because it transmits and receives radio waves, which are, which are longer than light, uh, visible light. Longer, they have a longer wavelength. That means they don't interact with clutter molecules like cloud droplets, and therefore they can see past them and work in bad weather conditions and at night. Also, since uh, SARS are uh, put on an airborne system, they're, they're able to virtually create a large aperture, aperture size through the use of motion and by taking multiple scans over the same region. And this allows them to create a high resolution image compared to traditional radar techniques. Like the other groups mentioned, if you use traditional data techniques, we would need an antenna size, antenna size about 400 times larger than the airborne platform, which would be impossible to carry. And finally, um, the SAR image is, uh, is formed by taking the 1D radar scan data that the, uh, that the radar uh, gives us. And by applying different image processing algorithms that we'll be exploring later, we, we, were, we had to compute a 2D image. Two of the main equations that we used throughout the program was the time and distance equation and the signal to noise ratio. So the uh, equation on the top left basically is a distance of a speed one. Uh, the radar transmit a ra transmits a radio wave that travels the distance R to the target, and then it comes back the same distance R back to the ra radar. So in total, it travels a distance of two R, and the speed at which it travels is C, the speed of light, 
And when you divide the, the total distance over speed, you get the time difference between the pulse transmitted and received. And the equation on the bottom uh, right signal um, computes the signal to noise ratio, which is basically telling us how strong the signal is. Noise is the unwanted interference that uh, occurs due to circuit failures or other reasons to the signal. And so the higher the signal to noise ratio, the lower the noise that there is and the better signal we have to compute and form an image. So the first step in the SAR process is command and control, which is essential to establish a connection with the emulator, which is the radar, and the host, which is the code. So the image processing can begin. In this process, the two most important things are encoding and decoding, in which byte strings with different types are used to communicate with the emulator. This is done through the implementation of several commands, which are shown below in our sequence diagram, that are sent to the radar. Byte strings that are then received from the emulator, which is essentially the raw data, scan data that will enable the main image processing to happen, which is done through the implementations of various algorithms and back projection, which will be talked about later. Um, so before we get into the actual algorithm, it's important to know what kind of data we're working with. So there are many 1D scans at different positions and with the known scan position. And provided, uh, and a provided list of signal amplitude values with known times, which is in picoseconds. And in case of our radar, in the case of our radar, each amplitude value is spaced 61 picoseconds. So it is crucial to know times in order to calculate the range of those amplitude values. Okay, so getting and organizing the data shown on the previous slide is very complicated because the radar hardware is error prone and must be corrected for. And this is simulated in the emulator as well. So we get the position data in a list, as you can see at the top there. However, measurement points are given by timestamp. Uh, and data from each measurement point comes in multiple packets that must be stitched together. Packets may be out of order or completely dropped, as you see on the bottom. So our technique is to sort received data by timestamp and assign position data to the timestamps based on the position value um, of each packet. And then we fill in missing data with zeros to make them compatible with our algorithm. So this is our client for interfacing with the emulator. And at first, we had to check for uh, the Bolton test, right, which might fail. So at the, the Bolton test fail, we reboot the emulator until it's successful. And then we do a com communication check, which uh, establishes that communications are uh, proper for the emulator. And then from this, we get the time step. Then we set the configuration. And then we start collecting data. And at the bottom is a table that monitors packet loss. Uh, and packet loss is just one of the um, one of the error models built into the emulator. So now we're going to talk about back projection, but the easiest way to explain this is to uh, show an example and put implementation of it. Um, so to understand our implementation, we need to dive down to the level of a single scan, which is equivalent to one UAV measurement position. So for each pixel, we know the, the radar position and the pixel position, so we can calculate the range to the radar. We can then calculate the time this corresponds to using the radar range equation we showed earlier, and then get the signal amplitude measurement close to that time and assign the pixel to that value. But this is what the plot might look like for the first data for the first scan point. And then at the second scan point, we get a different plot. Then finally at the end, we have a completely different plot for that last scan point. And after generating a plot for each scan point, we add, we add them up and normalize them and and the data um, and the data and the data that has reflectors in they constructively interfere and brighten up the pixels whereas the data that doesn't have any value in they eventually are dropped in the long run uh, and this is uh, an so example like an yeah. yeah this is an example of uh, a scan or an image being uh, produced procedurally so at first we have no scans, and as we incorporate more scans, we get a more coherent image. All right, so in summary, back projection is a technique that maps signal samples to ground positions. And our implementation is one way that can be done. So as you can see, this technique is versatile because it works with any flight path, as long as you know the measurement points. Other techniques of SAR processing, uh, such as those including uh, Doppler shifts, are more efficient, but generally require assumptions to be made such as a straight flight path, which is difficult to achieve on an airborne platform because of turbulence. 
and others require sufficiently distant imaging areas. But this versatility comes at a trade-off because back projection is inefficient since it's a brute force technique that requires individual processing of each scan. Another issue that comes to this is that we have to select a window to image. Right? So we solve this by processing and collecting data in two passes. Right? So the first pass will do a wide range with low resolution, such as in the left image. And in the left image, we see there are two plots that are, or two squares that are accumulating energy. For example, the one in the white box. So then we can select that window, pass those parameters into the second pass, and then we can make a more detailed image of the target. So like all the other groups, we heavily optimized our algorithm using the NumPy library. We were able to optimize it even more using pre-processing. So we pre-calculate all the pixel positions based on image window and resolution, as you can see here in the column and the row on the right. We also try to perform as many operations as possible beforehand, and this reduces the amount of time spent on each pixel, which greatly improves efficiency considering the amount of scan data and pixels we have to process. We also utilize broadcasting with the Python NumPy library. So on the right, you can see that instead of calculating the square distances independently at each pixel, we calculate the x distance of each column and y distance of each row, then broadcast these together as demonstrated in the highlighted cell. This greatly reduces the amount of space we need because we have two one-dimensional arrays, whereas calculating x squared and y squared distances independently would produce two two-dimensional arrays behind the scenes. For the same reason, this also greatly improves efficiency. Each squared x distance and y distance operation is only being performed once. So these two optimizations combined allowed us to enjoy the time complexity benefits of pre-processing while also mitigating the memory complexity associated with it. Uh, so we can demonstrate that here in one of our benchmark runs. So this is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels and 1,000 scans, and it finished in six seconds on one of our computers. Thank you. And uh, before we end, I have a demonstration to do. So I'll just be sharing my screen. All right. So. Uh, wait, Nicholas and everybody, can you see my screen? Uh, I can right. see the terminal. All right. So by the way, for context, uh, with our scan times, we figured that we wouldn't get it any faster without getting a new computer. So we decided to do things simultaneously, right? So we uh, collect data, process data, and visualize data uh, at the same time. So first, let's run the first pass, the first pass of our client. So, so let's do uh, image three. We start the emulator internally. This window shows up. Just wait for this to complete. Now we're uh, prompted to zoom into a relevant window and close the plot window. So let's see here. Now we can run the second pass. Yeah, so as you can see here, it's uh, runtime processing. So it's processing while it's receiving the scan packets. Yeah, so uh, this allows us to uh, process completely new, uh, completely new offline data for which we don't know the initial parameters. So uh, for example, for the final composition, this meant that we were able to uh, uh, basically fly by all the marathon data All right, thank you. So um, are there any questions? Yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, was there any particular feature that you tried to implement and it didn't work as you expected? Uh, well, most of the different features that we started, we at least um, finished in some aspect. I don't know, Sam, do you wanna expand on that? Yeah, so at first we wanted to like uh, 
take an image and try to find like the brightest parts of it and try to find targets, which would then be passed into like a second pass. And it would do that automatically. However, we couldn't really get that to work. So we just made the user do it, as you saw before, where we like select a range window. All right. How did you manage to decrypt the byte strings while working with the API messages? Oh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, how did you manage to decrypt the byte strings while working with the API messages? Could you repeat the last part of the question? Um, basically, how did you decrypt the byte strings while working with uh, the a a MRM API messages? Oh, the status? Yeah. Oh, uh, so, well, basically, we just, so we had a list of the different data types that we were expecting to receive. Um, and then based on that, we parsed through the different byte sizes, and then we uh, casted the values that we needed. So then, like, for the status value, um, you just cast that to, like, the N32 or whatever it was. All right. Uh, what advice would you give someone who's starting this course afresh? Um, honestly, I think I would advise that uh, so we, we spent a lot of time uh, deciding how to even get started at the beginning. Um, and it's better to just, I think, start coding sort of um, and sort of tackle the issues as you get to them because we're just more productive that way. And uh, additionally, uh, read the documentation. There's like a lot of information there. Andrew, you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering how you guys set up like the separated data, like for the logging, like was that a library or so it was really cool and it's a good way to like monitor progress and stuff. Uh, um, do you mean like the library? Uh, what yeah, specifically are you asking about? Like when you were doing the back projection, like the live logs in the terminal, how it was like showing how many things were dropped and like how many scans. Yeah, so uh, basically in the scan pool, we have like a timeout for when we want to accept that a scan is gonna get any more packets. So we count how many missing packets are in a scan whenever that happens. And then we add that to a counter to count the total number of incomplete uh, scans, drop packets. And to detect the number of uh, drop scans, for example, like scans where none of the packets came, uh, we kind of had to estimate that uh, using the timestamps in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I had one quick question. So, like, that was really cool how you guys plotted it, um, like all the data live, and the Im you could see the image coming together. I was just wondering, how did you guys do that? Um, how did you guys get the platform positions um, to like know where the scans were? Um, yeah. So for that one, uh, so we used the same interpolation function that the emulator uses to get the positions real time based on the timestamp. Uh, so you were calculating the platform position while running as well? Yeah. That's really cool. Otherwise there was no way to do live processing. Yeah. And the live processing was much more efficient because um, when collecting the data, we spent a lot of time just waiting for packets. So this way we could use that time in between to um, process the scans that we did have. And additionally, uh, this kind of nullifies our processing time because you're doing it in between the packets or in between uh, receiving packets. All right, thank you, team one. Uh, next up, we have team two. Hello, so we're team two or team olives, um, and this is our presentation. Uh, I'm Eleanor. I'm Tanesh. I'm Felix. I'm Ty. And I'm Jessica. Um, so what is SAR? In order to understand it, we need to know the difference between optical and radar imaging. Uh, so optical imaging is a type of photography that we're used to on a daily basis, like an iPhone or a film camera. Because they rely on like photons that are emitted by a light source, optical imaging is limited by atmospheric conditions and they provide limited information. And they also don't work very well at nighttime because, of course, there's no light. Radar imaging, on the other hand, uses radio waves sent out from the radar to form images. As such, they don't rely on atmospheric conditions or light level, and they work in bad weather or in nighttime. You can kind of see here on the right side, an image of how radar imaging was used to take photos of a port. Like normally, um, the clouds would obstruct the view, but um, with radar imaging, that's really not a problem at all. 
Additionally, radar imaging can provide a lot of key information on the scan areas because certain waves pass through certain building materials and reflect off others, and it lets us see what kind of structures are inside buildings. Um, SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar, and it's a form of this radar imaging. Uh, with radar imaging, the larger the aperture, the better the image. And as such, SAR used artificially created or a synthetic aperture to form images. Um, and in this bottom image, you can kind of see how it works. Like as the radar moves along the line, the entire length that it moves um, becomes the length of the aperture. And this allows for a much higher resolution and a lot more information as compared to like traditional means of imaging. So I'm going to go over a general overview of how our system works. So first, before we can run any of our programs, we need to set the configurations that we want for each image, like scan amount, the image size, the resolution, that sort of thing. Then we need to set up communications with the radar, or in this case, an emulator, because we don't have the actual radar. And then we send that configuration data to the radar using our encoder function to encode all of the messages into bytes. Then we send and receive a couple more confirmation rest messages, making sure everything's working properly. And we decode all of those messages into a readable dictionary. And then the radar is going to send us a bunch of scan data messages, which we store into a NumPy array, and then store that NumPy array into a NumPy file. And then finally, we use back projection to plot the scan data and form an image like the one in the bottom. Uh, but before we could do any kind of like that sort of analysis, our first course of action for our group was to send and receive messages from the radar to our system. Um, so the program used the Pulse on 440 radar and emulated it. And there's like an API that has all the different types of messages it could send. Um, so essentially, we just needed to implement all these different messages so that our system could properly encode and decode them. Uh, we first started by implementing the contact message, which ensured that we could send and receive all data types. And this is really important because uh, each data type has a different byte size. And if the byte size is wrong, a whole bunch of issues can come up. Um, but after that, we decided to standardize the implementation instead of like doing it manually for um, each like message type. We created the encoder and decoder classes, which uh, helps a bunch in terms of making it a lot faster to implement. Yeah, so um, the first thing that we did, like Jessica was saying, is we did that stuff. And then eventually, we made our classes file, which had the encoder and decoder class. So our encoder basically took a dictionary of predetermined information and data types and turned that into a byte array. And then it sent the message to the uh, radar or the emulator. And then the decoder, on the other hand, uh, it takes a byte array from the emulator and then it also takes uh, predetermined information and converts it into a readable dictionary. So this way we could really quickly set up uh, messages based off of the API. And it was really quick to implement the rest of the messages after we had our classes file. So basically to create our image, we needed to set various parameters that would allow us to better collect data from the emulator and to better plot our image. However, since each image uh, had different data and since each image was located in different places on our graph, we decided to create JSON files that contained the optimal values for each image, simplifying our process significantly. However, this process varied between files that ran through the emulator and files that did not. For example, for files that ran through the emulator, we had to set many more variables such as the scan start, scan end, base integration index, scan amount, transmit gain, and scan interval, as you can see on the right, whereas files that did not run through the emulator required many less values and were thus easier to plot. So uh, first, I'm going to go over like what we do when we're running through the emulator. So we need to open up the emulator, and then we have our master file, which communicates with the emulator and receives and stores our data. So basically, we have uh, a coder list that is like the order of messages that we're going to send and then we're going to receive. So at the bottom, you can see that we have like encoder uh, 315, which represents, I believe, the bit error check. And it's just a massive list of uh, encoders and decoders. So that's how we uh, communicated with the emulator. And to actually store the data, what we did is we created a 2D array of zeros based off of what we expected, how much information we expected. And based off the message ID and message index, we were able to find the correct location that we wanted the data to be stored in, and we just put it in there.
And then we saved that uh, 2D array into a NumPy file, which uh, we'll use in the analyzer. OK, so now I'm going to go over the analyzer file, which is the file that runs the back projection algorithm. So as Felix just said, we store the scan data into a NumPy file. So we read in that NumPy file into our analyzer file and use our configuration parameters to set up the parameters of the SAR image. And then we run the back projection algorithm on it. So back projection is very computationally expensive, but it is also pretty much the most accurate way to form a SAR image. So the steps of that that we use is first we use the size uh, of each pixel in our configuration to determine the position of each pixel in meters, like in the plane. Then using that and using the platform position of the radar at each point, we can calculate the distance from the radar to each pixel just using the distance equation. Then using the range to time equation, we can figure out the time it takes for the signal to like go from the radar to each pixel and back. Then using those times, we can calculate an index and index into our data array, to figure out which like amplitude in our data array corresponds to each pixel. Then we're, we repeat all of those steps for every scan, sometimes thousands of scans, summing together the amplitudes and then plotting the image with matplotlib. So basically for the files that ran through the emulator, we encountered like many various errors that we would face that would occur with real flight paths and radar errors. So for example, in the case of out of order messages, we would solve this issue by sorting all of our messages that were swapped. So we wouldn't plot data in the wrong places. Next, in the case of drop messages, all we would do is simply fill up our drop messages with zero since we have no idea what values would be sent. And finally, in the case of bit failure, we would raise an error and reboot our program. As you can see on the bottom, and where we would first check if there's a bit error and then print a message and reboot our program. Um, so we ran into a lot of problems throughout the uh, entire four weeks. Um, I won't go over all of these on the slide just um, to save time, but I'll go over like the most important ones. Um, so one of our first like big problems was that we ran, um, was that our system plotted like zero, zero, like the origin at the bottom left of the image, while the original image was centered at zero, zero. And in order to fix that, we added the offset values for X and Y, which let us move around the image. It also let us search the image, uh, search for the image in case the image wasn't centered at zero, zero. Uh, and another really, really big problem was that some of our generated images were turning into these really weird wavy circles and we had no idea why. And it turned out to be an issue with some of our configuration settings, uh, which resulted in really bad aliasing, uh, which, uh, aliasing is essentially like a bunch of ghost images that are like interfering with the actual image and it makes the image like basically unseeable. Um, in order to fix this, we just adjusted our base integration index and scan range, which are like values in our configuration and it helped a lot. Um, so one of our last issues is that some of our generated images were really hard to make out. And so we set a value in our configuration that lets us increase the contrast of the image. Um, it's pretty simple, but all it does is it just squares the amplitudes at each point. So it creates a higher difference between the values. Um, so here's kind of an example of uh, kind of our like troubleshooting process. Um, so as I was like saying before, like the really weird circles, um, this is one of our first like images that we generated. We did not was we did not know what was going on here, uh, although it does look really cool, um, but it's definitely not the image we were looking for. Um, but then we figured out it was aliasing, so then we kind of adjusted it and zoomed in onto certain parts. Um, and we got this, which is still really badly aliased, but we can see something there. Um, and you can't really tell what's going on because it also has really low contrast and everything's kind of blending in with each other. Um, so here's our last version. Um, it has pretty high contrast, um, so you can kind of like make out everything. Um, we made the resolution higher and we got rid of the aliasing by like once again changing this integration and scan range um, and then we get this really awesome photo of Bob Shin who is the director of BevoWorks. Okay so um, obviously besides the back projection algorithm the most second possibly the most important part of this is getting things to run fast. Um, normally these algorithms can take a super long time. So, and we do so many iterations that it's imperative that this algorithm takes as little time as possible to execute. Um, so how we do it is we use something called vectorization. So Python as a language is very easy to develop in, but it's extremely slow at 
iteration in particular, but slow at everything. Um, and because the core of our computation is in iteration, it does a lot of iteration, as other groups have said, um, we need a way to speed this up. And there is a way to speed this up. And what we basically do is we use a different programming language called C, which is much, much faster at this type of computation because of some technical details, like about how it's more low level, it can guarantee the type of the data and the location of the data and memory and stuff like that as better. And it can basically execute the same computations, but in about 100th of the time. So obviously most of our computation is vectorization. What it looks like is imagine you wanted to add two arrays together by adding each of their elements up like pair by pair and spitting out a new array. So normally that'd be very hard in Python. You'd have to iterate over all the pairs and add them up. But with vectorization, you can, um, vectorization allows you to do this process, but basically much faster, basically in the fastest possible time a computer can execute aforementioned function because it leverages, you know, the fact you're doing the same thing to every pair and stuff like that. Um, Vectorization is very important to um, being able to execute this program in like less than 10 minutes. Like if you want to get any sort of resolution, you need to use NumPy, which everyone, all the groups I think used. So here's some of the images we formed. This first image on the left is a five point scatter. This is the first thing that all the groups generated. It's the very first image we had. And this was by far the hardest image to generate. Um, just because um, we didn't know what was going on, but you know, once we got it, it was um, it was so simple, um, and we're able to generate this image in like make five or six seconds um, with relatively okay resolution. And this image it was a pain to get, but once we were able to get this five point scatter, we're able to get a lot of other things. So, on this is like an example of a high definition image. So this is of a jellyfish and you can see it's like nearly has the same like um, optical fidelity of like a normal picture, which I think is really cool. And here is a generated QR code. So, you know, there's many different types of images you can detect with this radar um, and this QR code works. So here's another scatter. This was um, a scatter of MIT. Um, we generated this right after we did our five point scatter. It, it took like probably like one tenth of the time to generate um, because we knew what we were doing at that point or closer to it. There's another high definition picture of the Infinity Gauntlet from Infinity War, um, Avengers, that's Thanos probably. And there's another five point scatter of a smiley face, not five point scatter, just smiley face scatter. Yeah, thank you everyone for listening. And just like quickly, I'd like to say thank you to all the instructors and TAs for being like super awesome and like the best. Um, yeah, from team two, thank you. Yeah, thank you team two. Uh, great presentation. Anybody have any questions for them? I have can a question. Go? Oh, you can go first. Okay, fine. Uh, can you go more in depth about your group's approach to dealing with different message types? Um, so the way we dealt with different message types was, um, like each message, uh, I can go back to the slide, but, uh, basically we had like different, like, um, I guess you could call them like objects for each, um, type, like message, uh, type. And there was like the encoder messages and the decoder messages. So we make a different, like, um, dictionary for each different type. Um, and within like the classes, we would encode and decode the different um, data types differently using like different parsing algorithms and all that. So it was pretty generalized, I'd say. So, like an image of one of those uh, objects. So I have a question. I saw that you guys had a slide with all of the problems that you ran into. What is the problem that you think was the most difficult to face and why? Uh, I'd say one of our most difficult problems, which is one we didn't know like what was going on with. Um, so it was probably 
one of the ones with like the images that we rendered just like did not look right. Um, like the aliasing, we just had no idea what was going on. Um, and we didn't know if like it was a problem with the emulator. So we were just like confused out of our minds. Um, so that was probably just the most difficult. But I think once we actually figured out these sort of problems, it was like a super easy fix. Like all we had to do is change a number. Um, so honestly, it's kind of interesting, like the hardest problems to figure out were the easiest to fix. Uh, how did you actually manage to say uh, incorporate the error models into your code? Like for example, the built-in test failure is a burn only trial, but how did you manage to say uh, incorporate it into your code? Uh, different data models? The error, yeah, the different data models. Oh, like running it through the emulator or not? Um, so basically we had two different modes to run the program in, um, but it was essentially like we would have like an ability like turn on, um, like if we ran through the emulator or not, we, or that was in like a configuration setting. Um, so we could run that through the command line. Um, and if we ran it through the emulator, we'd have to run like the master.py file um, and the analyzer.py file, which are two that were mentioned. But if we didn't, we'd only have to run analyzer um, and we just change the settings. But it was pretty simple. Um, cause as long as you like turned it, like, like turn the little switch on or whatever, um, like your code would like be able to figure it out like by itself. So it's pretty nice. All right. Then thank you team two. Um, before we get into team four is just a heads up. This is almost definitely going to go long. Uh, so sorry about that, but we want to make sure that we give the students the chance to, to showcase what they've done. So, um, we're going to stick around here while uh, team four gives their presentation. So you can go ahead and start. All right. So welcome everyone to team four's. Uh, UAS saw our final presentation for the BWSI course. So this is our team. Everyone can unmute themselves and introduce themselves now. Hi, I'm Samantha. I'm a rising senior from New York City. All right. Hello, my name is Shivnath. I am a rising senior in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm a rising senior from Virginia. I'm Derek. I'm a rising junior from Bridgewater, New Jersey. And I'm Luca. I'm a rising senior from just outside of Chicago. All right, let's start with our table of contents. So we're going to go over a SAR overview, our system overview, the results, and the lessons that we learned from the course. So let's start with the SAR overview. So what is SAR? So you've probably heard this multiple times already today, but SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar. Now, a radar sends out pulses and listens for when they return. And using the radar range equation, we can convert the time the pulse traveled into distance to determine how far away objects are. Now, as you can see on the image to the left, the plane is uh, taking multiple viewing angles of this red box here. So the SAR combines multiple viewing angles of the radar to create one cohesive image. And the process of creating this one cohesive image is through software that we will talk about uh, now. So why do we use synthetic aperture radar? SAR allows us to collect scan data at any time of day and in any weather. So compared to normal imaging, we wouldn't be affected by natural phenomena like you can see on the image to the right. We have clouds, but in the bottom image, we do not, which is a SAR image. And instead of having a giant radar aperture, we can just scan at points along a trajectory and combine them to create an image. So there's less bulky hardware and more innovative software solutions in SAR. So now we will go into our system overview. So these are the four subsystems in our system. We have the client, the emulator, data, and back projection. It should be worth noting that all arrows pointing towards the emulator are uh, encoded, so we have to decode those. So let's start with the configuration. So our goal here was to find an easy way to run and change the settings. And we had a few problems with this, the first of which that it was very tedious to edit the code every time we ran, and it was kind of hard to use. So to solve this, we used a config.yml file to store the settings, and we created a GUI to also run our program. So we were able to change multiple uh, different things, including the number of scans, the scan start and end time, as well as the resolutions. And as you can see to the left, we have a picture of our very nice GUI. So one thing we can actually edit uh, besides in our configuration is we can actually create a continuous collection mode. So in the API, if we were to set our number of scans to exactly 65535, then the client and the emulator will run infinitely and will basically be receiving uh, just data infinitely until we tell it to stop. 
And so what this does is it helps us to stop uh, underscanning or overscanning. So if we were to underscan by too much, our image would be kind of messed up. And same thing with overscanning, we would receive all zeros. And so what we do is we basically scan infinitely until we receive all zeros. And from there, we remove that zero data set from our scan info list, and then we automatically stop the code. Next, we'll talk about error handling. Um, the emulator we worked with has the capability to mimic errors that can occur in the wild. Um, errors can occur for a multitude of reasons, such as broken hardware and poor data handling. Um, when creating our program, we had these errors in mind so that we could create an adaptable program that would work regardless of these errors. The first type of error we'll talk about today is the built-in test failure, um, commonly known as bit failure. Um, the problem with this error is that the emulator returns data that is all zeros, meaning that it's not recording the data properly. Our solution to this was to check a value that the emulator returns, which indicates whether or not the error is present. If we detected that the error was present, we rebooted the emulator and recollected the data in hopes that the error would not reoccur and that the data would be useful for our imaging purposes. Next, we'll talk about packet loss. Um, the problem with packet loss is that some data is lost during collection. Um, and our solution was to use interpolation to generate more data and insert it in the places where they're missing. Interpolation is a mathematical process where new data points are generated based on patterns found within a given data set. So when we noticed that data was missing, we gave our program nearby data points so that it could create data that made sense. Um, and the last type of error that the emulator can mimic is out of order packets. The problem here being that scan data is received out of order. Our solution to this was pretty simple. Just sort the, pro sort the data before we process it. Yeah, so now we're going to move on to the data subsystem. And our goal for this uh, data storage is pretty simple. We just don't want it to get in the way of anything. We actually did have a few challenges with our initial implementation of this. Those being that the data took a long time to read from our CSV file and that we were actually using two files to store raw and process data. Um, to solve this, we cut our storage down to one file and we basically just changed how we accessed and parsed, parsed the data. And we used CSV reader and JSON to do this. Um, and this gave us a huge speed up over our previous combination of pandas and the AST library. So now we're gonna talk about data processing and our goals for this are pretty simple. Um, basically we wanna connect the scans to the corresponding platform positions and correct for packet loss. We didn't have any really huge challenges with this. And as Samantha mentioned, we use interpolation, which effectively generates new data to fill in gaps based on the surrounding data to account for packet loss. And then we simply connect position and scan data in an array. So one problem we faced uh, was we actually didn't know when we generated our image, where our image would be exactly, because we would be scanning hundreds of meters away. And so what we tried to do is we implemented an auto image finding program to find the center of the image. So what this would do is it would go to a scan, find the center of the, where the actual data was. And according to that index, we would create kind of a circle around the, a circle of a certain radius, uh, kind of around that point. And maybe we would look around halfway across uh, our total scans. And we would do the same thing for another scan. And we'd find where these two circles intersected. And we would do this for every single scan. And then we would average it. And this gave us the center of our image. And basically, in order to, I guess, determine the center of the data from a scan, we kind of used an equation similar to finding the center of mass, where we multiplied distance by the signal amplitude. Then we added them all together. And at the end, we divided by our total signal amplitude to find where the center of the data was. So moving on to the back projection subsystem, we sort we're gonna encounter one of the most critical parts of our whole system, which is the back projection algorithm itself. And our goal for this implementation is if for it to produce a quality image in a reasonable amount of time. And like every other group, we did have a few issues with this. So first, back projection is inherently computationally expensive. And secondly, our original implementation uh, made it much worse. So to solve this, um, like the other groups, we vectorized our code. So instead of going pixel by pixel for every scan, 
um, we back projected each scan as a whole. So we were going over like the whole thousand by thousand array. Um, we tried to get rid of the iterating over scans, but that just gave us a gigantic memory block and we realized it wasn't fast. Um, and secondly, we utilized multi-threading, which basically allows us to do operations concurrently instead of in sequence. And with this, we were able to back project multiple scans at a time. So like if I have 10 threads on my computer, I can back project 10 uh, scans at a time. And this vastly improved our performance and speed. So after doing this algorithm, but before we can display the image, we need to oftentimes apply some techniques uh, in order to produce something that is clearly visible. Um, but because some of the values are sometimes too close together or too obscured by noise, it can be hard to make out features in an image. Uh, to solve this, we picked a different color map um, with more contrast between values relatively close together. And we also added a, a few filters and other image processing techniques to make it even clearer. So first, we added a Gaussian blur to help reduce the noise so that we could run a maximum filter on the image, which takes the largest value in a given area and sets all pixels in the area to that value. After doing this, we can multiply the value of each pixel in the area by constant scaling value. Uh, because the color maps are scaled linearly, doing this will result in a larger difference between two pixels and therefore more contrast. However, this sometimes gives the problem that if the scaling value is too high, the majority of the image will be increased far past the color maps range and nothing will be visible. So we can just shift down all the values uh, by subtracting a set value and bring the main image back within the color maps range. Finally, for the marathon, uh, because speed was so important, we created a new script to run only post-processing from a pickle file already created as output from the back projection algorithm so that we wouldn't have to repeatedly run the very computationally expensive back projection algorithm on the same set of data uh, after we've already processed it. So to illustrate the importance of our post-processing, uh, this is an example of a image from the marathon uh, with the default color map and no post-processing. As you can see, it's not very visible at all. This is only changing the color map. Um, the shape is a little bit visible, uh, but again, it's still not very high quality and it could be much better. So here you can clearly see the image and this is after uh, applying the post-processing techniques and on the right, there's a change color map. Um, and you can clearly see that it's a beaver or some other small animal. So after doing our post-processing, we can use the matplotlib library to add axes and other important labels, and we can just display the image and save it for export. So next, we'll present some of our results. Um, by the end of the program, it took us about 14 seconds, depending on the computer, to run a 1,000 by 1,000 uh, pixel area with 1,000 scans. Uh, and now for some of our images, um, some of these are from much earlier in the process. And as you can see, uh, this is a smiley face, but it's not very clear. There's a lot of noise and blurring. Uh, next, we have a low resolution uh, image of Bob Shin, uh, one of the Beaverworks directors. And a outline of, uh, with dots of Baby Yoda. Another outline of a dog at about a 45 degree angle. And finally, this is a little better quality, a scatter plot of MIT. Yeah, so now we're gonna move on to some of the images that we actually got during the final challenge. So this is one of a great white shark. Um, and this is a picture of the moon uh, that we applied a lot of color maps to, to like actually make it visible because originally it was not visible. Um, here's a panda. Um, there's a gel another jellyfish photo there. A little bit lower quality than the other group, but um, we have a Totoro, a tiger with the bone color map. And we have the Linux penguin. 
and a dog. Uh, the Infinity Gauntlet from Avengers. And here we have uh, two side-by-side -side logos of Lincoln Labs. One is from like basically the first image that we um, took in the very beginning of the course. The second one is something we got during the marathon. And as you can see, it's um, way clearer. And it sort of represents like how our code and like our team um, sort of grew as a, over the, the course. And I mean, at the beginning, it was like, we were just sort of trying to figure it out. Like you could see something there, um, but it wasn't very clean. But at the end, our code was like a lot more cleaner, a lot easier to read. Our team worked a lot better together. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, and that will be going over lessons that we learned uh, all throughout the course. So our first lesson is documentation. You need to add comments everywhere and uh, basically keep all your variable names clean as well because especially when working with a team, it saves a lot of time and energy. Secondly, just don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, your peers are working on the same thing as you, and it's likely that they might be struggling on the same things as you. And your instructors are also very knowledgeable. And lastly, failure is just part of the process. You need to fail in order to learn. And uh, even when you restart, you're going to be restarting off of things that you learned in the past. So that's it for our presentation. Thank you, guys. And do you have any questions? I have a question. Uh, you talked about um, an algorithm that automatically found the range, right? So yeah, the algorithm would automatically find the center of the image. So like, for example, this QR code. Uh, oh. So yeah, I guess back to the QR code, it would kind of find like the image, the center of the image of the QR code for us. And we all we would have to do is just tune the I guess, range and what size we want the image to be. Yeah, so for us, uh, we actually had like two copies of the same image kind of flipped. And you guys had that too? Yeah, we had uh, the same thing. That's why when we have two circles intersecting, we would receive two points back. And these two points would basically be one of the images and the other one would be the image flipped. Yeah, so like if you took the average of both of those, it would be like in the middle and you would, you wouldn't have anything there. So how would you so, deal with that? Oh yeah, so I kind of misspoke. So what I meant by average was we average from like one to 500 scans. So we would average like the first point to the first point of the second scan to the third scan. And so we would still end up with two points in the end. All right, thank you. So I have a question for you guys. Um, what were like some of the skills you were looking forward to learning from this course and uh, what are the actual skills that you achieved during this course? I can take this question. Um, coming into this course, I expected to learn um, about radars and like how they work. Um, I didn't have a lot of previous experience with them. So that was something I was really interested in learning about. Um, and I definitely did learn a lot about radars and SAR through the lectures. But I also learned a lot about um, just like technical Python things that I didn't think would be a part of this course. Um, I learned a lot from my peers and from the instructors. And I think it just like the environment of working in a team um, allowed me to learn a lot about Python and SAR. Nice. So uh, what's the what's your favorite part of like working as a group? Um, I guess I'll take this one. So, I mean, my favorite part of working as a group is just sort of like being able, like when you have an issue and you're trying to solve it by yourself, it's pretty hard. You're like, oh, wow, I'm pretty, I'm stupid and everything. But when you have a group, there's, a, you can ask the question, um, odds are so either somebody else is going to be struggling with the same issue or they're going to know the answer. And both of those are better than doing it on your own. And it also makes it way easier to like improve your code. And like, you know, you know, other people are, um, there for you and like there with you. All right, so we're a little bit behind schedule. So um, we're gonna hold off on announcing the team awards until during the closing ceremonies. Uh, so you'll get to hear about those there. Um, and I just quickly wanna say, you know, what you built here is is something that a team of professional engineers would probably struggle to build in the time given. And the fact that you did this while you're still in high school is amazing. Um, Y'all have extremely bright futures ahead of you and you should all be incredibly proud of what you did. Um, keep doing what you're doing, and I really hope our paths cross again. 
So good luck with your futures. Um, I'll see you all in the final presentation or the, the closing ceremonies so we can all hop.